Welcome to this brief overview of the key terms in assessment. I'll be talking briefly about each of the following four terms, reliability, validity, assessment bias, and practicality. We'll be using these terms frequently as we work on the assessment inventory, so I want to make sure that you're very familiar with what they mean and how they're applied in educational settings. So the first term we're going to discuss is reliability, and this probably is the hardest one to understand. Reliability basically means repeatability or consistency. And the theory behind this is if you gave your students a test, got their scores, gave them a mind wipe so they didn't remember having taken it, gave them the assessment again, etc., over and over and over again, they'd get about the same score every time. So what that means in real life is that as a student reads the question or the assignment description, they understand what's being asked of them. If they know the answer, they can respond appropriately. If they don't know the answer, they're going to get it wrong. And they would do that uh, given that assignment every single time. Okay. But there's another side to that as well. So first we're looking at how the assessment is written, but we also need to look at how the assessment is graded. Can you grade it consistently? So, uh, obviously a multiple choice test is going to be more consistent or more reliable in the grading than an essay or a project would be because those things are open to some outside kind of subjective factors like how you're feeling. Are you really tired when you're grading the essays? Some of them. And awake when you're grading others? Um, are you affected as you go through the grading process by having read maybe one really good one and then the rest of them seem not so great after that? So there are these issues of whether or not you can be consistent when you're grading. We need to be aware of those. Here's a little graphic that uh, represents some of the different types of reliability and help us to understand these issues a bit better. First of all, there's inter-rater reliability. So this gets to that grading side of things. If I grade an assignment and one of my colleagues grades the same assignment, would we give it about the same score? If it's a multiple choice test, we certainly should. If we're using a really good rubric, a grading mechanism that helps us to look for certain things and, and describes what the various levels or grades on those items would be, then we're going to be a little bit better about it. But if we just read an essay and go with our gut, hmm, that's a B paper then we're not going to have very good inter-rater reliability. We're also going to look for internal consistency. What that means, for example, on a paper and pencil test, is that if a student knows the content very well, they should get pretty much all of the answers correct. If a student doesn't know the answers very well or the content very well, then they'll probably miss the majority of questions. We start to worry if a student gets one right and one wrong and one right and one wrong and one right and one wrong on and on. If that's happening, then most likely that assessment is not very reliable. In other words, the students don't really understand what's being asked of them. And then, of course, we have this test retest reliability that I mentioned earlier. We should get the same score every time uh, an assessment is given. And that, again, feeds off of how clearly it is. So in real classrooms, here are some questions to ask yourself. Is my assignment description or test question clear? In other words, is the student trying to read my mind? Or is it clear what I want from them? Another question, is it open to multiple interpretations? This is especially true on project descriptions. Sometimes a student reads it and thinks we want one thing when in fact we wanted another. And that can be true on multiple choice questions to a degree, uh, essay questions especially, and you've all felt that when you were like, ah, I've got to read the instructor's mind, and that's not fair to them. Another question, is my grading mechanism clear? Will I be able to use it consistently? Some other questions that I really didn't talk about earlier but wanted to mention is student success on this assessment subject to factors such as mood. So we talked about the influence of your mood on grading, but what about the student's mood on that particular assessment? So you may design a beautiful assessment, implement it in the classroom, but the student's having a really crummy day. They just broke up with their boyfriend or something. So this next question, is it a single snapshot or does it take place over time? Those two kind of feed together. If I'm only getting one 
picture of what my student knows about the subject and it happens to be on that terrible day the student is having, then it's not going to be a reliable measure of what they actually know. I've got to keep that in mind. Single snapshots are not reliable. And discuss validity. Validity is all about alignment, okay? So I've got the little uh, graphic here of the arrow hitting the target. Is our assessment on target for what we've taught, okay? So you've learned about alignment, hopefully in your curriculum class, or you will do that soon. The idea here is that our assessment is actually giving us evidence of our students' knowledge of the objectives and the way we got our content. So we want to assess um, the content that we have taught and preferably assess it in a similar manner to the way that we've taught. So if we've taught through, you know, hands-on exploration, then some kind of hands-on exhibition would also be appropriate. And then we want to try and assess at the same level that we've taught. So if we've been going through and assessing at a very basic remember level, then, or teaching it at a remember level, then assessing at an evaluation level is not really appropriate. We can push students a little bit, but we don't want to push them really beyond anything that we've taught in class. I thought this graphic was interesting, carrying on that target theme. Sometimes students get confused between the difference um, between reliability and validity. So what we've got here is a great illustration of reliability and validity. As you see on the target on the left, that little cluster of yellow dots shows us that we're getting about the same score or the same placement on the target every single time, but it's nowhere close to the bullseye. So we're not actually measuring what we've taught, but whatever we're measuring, it's uh, pretty reliable. Okay, So it may be that instead of assessing my students' knowledge of the content, I'm actually assessing their writing ability. So students who write really, really well do great on my assignments because they're able to BS their way through it. That's, it's reliable, but it's not valid. The next graphic there shows us a, a real mess of an assessment where it's not reliable, we're not getting consistent results, and it's not hitting the target either. Okay, so if, a, if an assignment is not reliable, generally it's not valid either. Now we'll have some, some exceptions to that that I may mention later. And then last but, lot, but not least, of course, there, if we're hitting the target consistently, uh, we're, we're measuring what we said we were going to measure, and uh, we're doing it in a clear and consistent way, then we are really, really good to go. Moving on to our last two terms here, first of all, assessment bias. We want to keep our assessments as unbiased as possible in order to make them more valid and more reliable. Does that make sense? So, some questions to ask yourself. Is the assessment fair? Is there any way that the way I've designed it or the language that I've used would make it so that some of my students, regardless of their knowledge, can't be successful on it? So here are some ideas to go with that. Is the vocabulary that you use in the assessment at an appropriate level for your learners? So if you're teaching ninth graders and you're using college level vocabulary in the assignment description, they're really going to be confused about what they're supposed to do. And that says nothing about their knowledge of the content but about their knowledge of the language you've written to write it. So we've got to be careful about that, okay? Are the examples used familiar to all learners? Now, sometimes, uh, for example, on occasion, uh, male teachers will use a lot of sports analogies uh, in their assessment and in their instruction, and that leaves out a huge population of learners who aren't particularly interested in sports. We've got to be really careful about that because if we continue to use sports analogies in our assessments, our students really aren't able to exhibit what they know because they're confused by the analogy. Another question, is the work completed under the same circumstances for all students? Are they given the same amount of time? Are they given the same resources? So if we're asking students, for example, to complete a poster, yet we're not supplying the poster boards and the markers and things like that, we're depending on them to have those at home, and that's not fair. Same thing with internet-based assignments. I know I do a lot of those in this class, and I do that because I know you're going to be teachers, and we've got to get to the point where we, we can use the internet and, and are acting as professionals. But when we're teaching at the 
you know, secondary level, we really can't expect our students to have these resources at home. So we're going to have to use lab, for example, for internet-based uh, projects. So homework is going to be an issue uh, of bias. If I'm sending my students home to work on assignments, you know, I, I don't know what they're going home to. Maybe they have to take care of their younger siblings when they go home, and they really don't have time to do that homework. I'm not saying it should be eliminated entirely, but I am saying be aware of that issue, that any time I send work home, I'm introducing bias. And then the last question, and this seems somewhat similar to reliability, but I just wanted you to consider it separately. Can you evaluate the students without prejudice? So as you're going through and you're reading students' assignments, if you see their name at the top, that's immediately a prejudice factor. You develop a, an impression of somebody within 10 seconds of meeting them, and that continues to be a lasting filter and perspective that you use as you evaluate their work. So it's best if you cannot see the student's work or name on their work before you start to grade it. Uh, I often do that by having them do a title page on the front and then turning the title page to the back as I'm grading things so I don't know whose work I'm reading as I'm going through it. The last key term here is practicality, and this one's not in your textbook, but it's something that is very, very influential for every teacher and is impacting us on a daily basis. It's the reason why we have standardized testing instead of what may be more valid forms of assessment. So practicality is related to the time, money, and effort that an assessment requires. A quick phrase to remember it, maybe not appropriate, uh, is it cheap and easy, okay? So, um, for example, paper and pencil tests tend to be more practical than project or performance-based assessments, all right? They require less time for the students to complete, although they do take time for me to craft them. They don't cost a lot of money, I just have to make some copies generally. And they're not a ton of effort for myself or for the students. So they tend to be one of the more practical modalities. That being said, they're not always the best, right? So we have to keep that in mind. And I'm going to finish off this little discussion with a, with a reminder of some trade-offs that we make on a regular basis. The most valid assessment is typically not the most practical. So if I'm teaching my students how to do a skill, then the most valid assessment would be to have them perform that skill. But having every student in my class perform that skill takes a lot of time. And the preparation for the students takes a lot of effort. So it's not a very practical form of assessment, even though it's the most valid. And this is where our standardized testing movement has come from. It may be more appropriate to do teacher observations and teacher and student portfolios to assess accountability. But we simply don't have the resources to do that. Another one that we've already discussed is that take-home work is definitely more practical, but it introduces bias. And so that's a trade-off we're going to have to balance within our classroom. And then this one always kind of rankles with me. You know, we saw that target graphic that said that unreliable assessments are also invalid. But uh, the problem is some of the most valid forms of assessment, like project and performance-based assessment, are inherently less reliable than, for example, a multiple choice question. <sighs> so often the more reliable we make an assessment the less creativity we're going to get from our students so for example I give them an extraordinarily detailed assignment description this is exactly what I want you to do check 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 well how creative then can my students be in their response how much higher order thinking can they engage in if I've spelled out for them exactly what I want from them so sometimes I personally am willing to sacrifice the reliability, meaning my students will have multiple interpretations for the assignment for the sake of validity. I want to make sure that they can do what I'm asking them to do, even though it may look a little different from what I was expecting. And I just need to realize as I'm grading that I'm going to have a really wide range of things that I'm looking at. So maybe I need to make a little bit more flexible rubric. We'll talk about the development of rubrics later in the semester, but these are some issues I definitely want you to keep in mind as we go through the assessment inventory, and particularly as we look at the strengths and weaknesses of each type of assessment that we develop. I hope this little podcast helped you out in understanding these terms, and I look forward to you seeing you in class next week.